Before we get into today's spooky video, a warning. This story is not for the faint of heart. It features discussions of mental health, including suicide ideation. There's some substance abuse, relationship drama, the COVID pandemic, and just generally going to be a bit of a downer. Also, as a heads up, you will be seeing some drinking on camera as well as some dried blood. The, the blood is fake. It is no one's blood. Don't worry about the blood. She typed out the whole message and then, with a trembling finger, it send. It was only after that that she realized the message she had sent to her queer crush explaining all of her feelings had a typo. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. You spooked me there. I was just in the middle of telling some of my favorite scary stories. All the classics. Things like, did I mishear the last thing my great-grandmother said to me before she died? And that time I realized a woman was flirting with me only years later. Camula, if you're watching this, call me. Halloween? Oh, no, no. This is just what I do every Tuesday night. You mean to tell me that you don't find an excuse to dress up as the Lady Demetress from Resident Evil Village every chance you get? Sounds fake, but okay. You got here just in time for the scariest story of them all. A tale of terror unlike any previously seen. One about a global pandemic, CDC recommendations, and a handful of ineffective governments. Specifically, we are going to be talking about a group of people who are left to figure things out all on their own. <laughs> All my favorite dystopian tropes! Our story begins the most terrifying do with a podcast. Ooh! Technically, our story starts before that, but I think by now we all know the basics of COVID, so we're just going to skip that part. Dan Savage, Tristan Taramino say, be monogamous. <laughs> polyamory polyamory yeah. in person, face-to-face -face polyamory, canceled. Non-monogamy, canceled. That clip was from Dan Savage's podcast, The Love Cast, which discusses kink, sex, and relationships. Savage has a rather large following, especially in the kinky, queer, and non-monogamous worlds. While the tone of this is obviously meant to be rather light, the fact is that Savage and his guest Tristan Taramino, who you may remember from my last video, were essentially encouraging everyone to become monogamous, even if only temporarily. Now I want to make it clear that this was very early on in the pandemic, March 31st, 2020. Neither Savage nor Taramino had any idea, much like the rest of us, just how long this pandemic was going to last. It was honestly kind of funny to listen to this episode for this video and hear them recommending just bunking down with a fuck buddy for three weeks until this had all blown over. Ah, to be that innocent. But I also think that this clip gives us a bit of insight of the way that some people have viewed non-monogamy for the past year and a half. Unthinkable, paused on a break. In a situation where you're being encouraged to limit your contact as much as possible, it makes a sort of logical sense to look at a relationship structure that can sometimes span networks over entire states or even countries, well, to be out of the realm of possibility. The mainstream media hasn't helped much with this either, so much of the focus has been on traditional family structures. How to navigate the pandemic now that you're working at home for your 9 to 5 job while the wife is there too and a bunch of rambunctious kids are running around your house. Not that we non-monogamous people haven't gotten any attention at all. I did find a few articles and you'll actually find those down in the description box below if you'd like to give those a read. The majority of information though that I did find about how to handle the pandemic while being non-monogamous came from less mainstream sources. Things like Facebook groups or polyam influencers' Instagram posts. There are probably some YouTube videos out there as well. Hi everyone, here's what's bothering me today. This is just going to be a quick one because it's just something on my mind and I just want to vocalize how silly a lot of it is. A lot of people confuse polyamory with polygamy. One of the best ways, I think, personally, to try and explain it is, you know how we have relationships with different people? Take, for instance, if you have lots of siblings, right? And in a hopefully stable, loving, family-oriented, like, upbringing, you probably thought, yeah, I love my siblings. Sure, we don't get along all the time. We have some fights, but... I, I would significantly miss these people. I love them. I love spending time with them. It's always great to see them, especially if I've been away for a while. We have loving relationships with our friends. Hey, I haven't seen you guys in a while. Oh man, it's been too long. 
And you can do different things with these friends or family members or whatever, right? But you have groups of people in your life that you care very much about and openly admit to loving. For polyamorous people, that is just with partners. So what does it matter then if people are choosing to be with multiple people and they're all talking? Because guess what? That's what, as far as I can tell, most of polyamory actually is. Oh no! Communication bad, apparently? What are your boundaries? Here are my boundaries. Yeah, I know, civilization is really going to fall apart at this fucking concept. But I am just so fundamentally tired of people thinking that these are actually just evil, sinister people when really they're just trying to live their lives and they're just naturally expanding upon a concept that on some level all of us are familiar with. I think the hatred and the suspicion says a lot more about the people making the criticisms and yet it doesn't seem like they are willing to actually do that internal work and that is what's bothering me today. <laughs> Of the articles I did read, I do find it very interesting that at least half of them seems to have come out after March of 2021, and a lot of them had to dedicate time to just explain what non-monogamy even is. These weren't written for non-monogamous folk, they were written for intrigued gawkers. It feels kind of voyeuristic. Oh honey, you know who I haven't thought about for a while? <laughs> Those swingers next door. I wonder how they're faring during all of this. When I decided that I wanted to make a video about being polyamorous in the pandemic, I knew that the best source wasn't going to be some listicle on self. Oh no. If I was going to do this, I was going to have to go directly to the source itself, the actual non-monogamous community. So that's when I made a Google Drive survey. It's like my grandfather always used to say, you either die a hero or you live long enough to make a survey filled with open-ended questions. He was very ill. Wait a minute, he died in 1994, how did he? Now I am hardly the most scientifically inclined, nor do I consider myself a researcher per se. The survey definitely had its limitations. For one thing, it only had 39 respondents, which represents a pretty small portion of the overall non-monogamous community. With that said, I did manage to get quite a few respondents from all over the country, mostly concentrated in the main New England area, yes, but also some from Las Vegas, Ohio, Colorado. My personal favorite was somebody who wrote in from Texas and they wrote this little, little sad face next to that, right after show respect. <laughs> I even got a few folks from other countries, including Australia, Spain, and Switzerland. There are a wide range of relationship structures represented here, from solo polyamorous to kitchen table poly to hierarchical structures and relationship anarchists. Some people entered the pandemic with a whole gaggle of partners, and then others entered essentially single. So. The majority of people who responded to the survey were in their late 20s to mid 30s, though I did also get a smattering of 40 somethings. My youngest was 18 and my oldest was 53. I'm turning 34 in a few months, and yes, that does fill me with existential dread. Also, I remember to ask for people's pronouns, but I forgot to ask them about uh, their gender, sexuality, or ethnicity, so I'm not really sure about what the demographic breakdown as everyone is. I can imagine that a lot of the New England people were probably really white. By the way, I use she, her pronouns myself. I am a cis woman, bisexual disaster, and I am extremely fucking white if that wasn't obvious. Actually, I'm not really white, I'm really more translucent. Like, look at this, I'm a fucking jellyfish. My original survey was 18 questions long. Now, unfortunately, I can't go through every single question and give you every single answer. We'd be here all day if I did that. So instead, what I have done is divided up this video into four parts and then picked some of the best answers, doing my best to give as many as possible so you get a range of responses. Let's dive in, shall we? Probably unsurprising that some of my questions focus specifically on respondents' relationships, how they changed, if they met anybody new, and how the pandemic specifically played into that. Plenty of respondents say they didn't meet anyone new, citing reasons such as just feeling too much stress or feeling that it wasn't an appropriate time. I did not consider it. It didn't feel responsible to me. Which is very understandable. Some of us have been struggling just figuring out whether or not it's okay to hug our friends or how to navigate grocery shopping these days. Trying to figure out how to handle a new relationship in the midst of all of that just wasn't a priority for some. 
Still, a lot of people in my survey did manage to meet new connections and partners of various types, and it was a wide range of feelings about just how challenging that was. Quite a few made a point to mention that the inability to physically touch or meet in real life was a huge setback. It has been really challenging. I've only met a couple of new people in person, and negotiating safety and schedules has been much more difficult than prior to the pandemic. Zoom and text dating has sucked. It's very difficult to maintain a connection, and it's been frustrating to meet someone in person that I thought I had a connection with that I just don't jive with in real life. Now there were a few that said that they felt the pandemic actually made things easier for meeting new people. Meeting and getting to know somebody online removed some of the pressure they might have felt otherwise if they had actually met that person in real life. We were only able to video chat, which allowed us to emotionally connect without the pressure of physical interaction. However, these were existing friendships that developed into a deeper friendship with relationship potential. I did try a little bit of online dating, uh, and I'll be honest, it didn't work very well. <laughs> it just, I don't know, I got really frustrated only after a few weeks and ended up just deleting all the apps. As some of the respondents talked about, I too felt like there was a lot of pressure, and then I wasn't really sure it was the appropriate time to try and meet up with somebody. With that said, uh, I have met somebody rather new in the last couple of months and uh, through an online community, and that seems to be going well, I think. Uh, we've only been on two dates, and I'm always a little cautious to get like too excited about somebody new before we get you know, more established, but you know, something seems to be there. The anarchist part of my brain is like, we're cool, don't put expectations on it, just let it develop, it's all good. But the part of my brain that like really likes this person is like, I just want to braid their hair and have them tell me all their insecurities. And if they reject me, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna walk into the ocean with a rock. I don't have any chill. I don't. I was I was walking, I was walking with my in my hand and I tripped and it went into a storm drain. Yeah. As you can imagine, there were quite a few people who entered the pandemic with relationships that didn't end up lasting. I heard quite a few stories about uncouplings and de-escalations. My main second relationship essentially crumbled. While we're fine now, the fears of the pandemic, coupled with weird-seated fears about the possibility of hooking up with someone who might be infected, really put a strain on things. Neither of us connected with others during that time, but the fears were strong. There were some people who experienced escalations, but I did notice not quite as many as the previous category. And there were even a few who experienced both, losing some partners and gaining others. Polyamory, baby! My spouse chose to fully hibernate away from me and most others, and my additional partner was able to spend more time with me. For myself, a friendship with a Twitter mutual actually did end up escalating into a full-on relationship. We had known each other for a while, about a year before the pandemic, and during that time, we uh, started talking a lot more, and we definitely noticed a lot of mutual feelings starting to develop between us. So in March of this year, we ended up having a whole conversation and decided to give a long distance relationship a try. Not to make a big deal out of this or anything, but uh, we did recently start saying the L word to each other. So yeah, I can emotionally ruin him now. This pandemic has definitely had its share of challenges for everyone, monogamous and non-monogamous alike. The people that took my survey commonly brought up issues like having to limit which of their partners they could see or even be physically affectionate with. The most challenging thing during the pandemic was keeping track of everyone's contact statuses and arranging date nights around who was safe at the time, managing bubble groups. The detrimental effects on mental health was also a frequent talking point. I have had to rely on my partners far too often for support, and I do my absolute best to avoid being toxic about it. I want to be communicative and avoid burnout, and my current partners understand this, but I know it ultimately hurts them to see me in pain and makes it hard to interact when I'm basically always going through downtime. Conversations around taking care of one's mental health were very normalized, I noticed, during this pandemic, and I'm interested to see whether or not that's going to carry over as things return to normal, or if people are just going to abandon that in droves. Certainly in this country, lack of mental health care and services is a huge problem and it would be really nice to see that properly addressed. And of course, polyamorous people had to navigate safety concerns like their jobs and potential risk there. I actually even had one frontline medical worker chime in on their experiences. I work in a hospital. The fear of bringing home the virus to my polycule was intense. 
I started a decontamination process for getting home from work, which continues to this day. Because of how things are in my country, it kind of felt like there was this like extra pressure to be like extra good at the pandemic, you know, sort of like making up for all the asshats out there who just didn't give a fuck and weren't wearing masks or getting vaccinated or whatnot. So because of this, pretty early on the pandemic especially, a lot of people stuck to only sticking in their own households and interacting with those people. The issue is I'm an extrovert who lives alone. So there have definitely been times during this pandemic where I have really struggled with that isolation. As time has gone on, especially as vaccinations have become more available, I have had a lot more regular check-ins with people and been able to see people more frequently, which has definitely been very helpful. Still challenging at times. I, for one, wish I could definitely see my sexy adult time friends a lot more frequently. That'd be, that'd be nice, because oh boy does it feel like I'm just constantly is just starved for touch, but you know, getting through that. <laughs> Most triumphs shared were related to having been able to keep existing relationships going and even deepening those existing relationships. People celebrate being able to navigate things with existing partners and also being able to create new connections under previously unthought of conditions. I probably would have not pursued a long distance relationship with that much time and space difference if it weren't for the situation. At least based on my past experiences, I've always dated people I could go meet within three hours time max. I consider that a triumph because it has made me explore other ways of connection that I had really closed myself to and given me new communication and agreement tools to work with that I didn't have to use that much in relationships where I see in real life the person very frequently. I definitely relate to that last comment quite a bit. I wasn't exactly against long distance relationships before, but I definitely had my reservations. Now I'm in one, possibly creating a second one, and honestly, it mostly just feels nice. I mean, it is mildly annoying not being able to kiss anyone's adorable faces, but you know, we're making it work. I am finally getting my passport, so you know, hopefully we can fix the situation in the future. <laughs> oh God, I cannot wait for my international polyam slut tour. And one person shared a success that I definitely had to share in this video. One of my household had COVID, but we had a system in place and the other two didn't get sick, even though we all share a bed. Tony, if you're watching this, comment down below how the hell you pulled that off, because that is some straight up magic and the people deserve to know. Don't hold on to this, Tony. Coming for you. I feel like everybody has their sort of COVID precautions now down to a science, but certainly towards the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot more anxiety as everyone just did their best as they waited for the newest WHO and CDC recommendations to come out. So it's no surprise to me that I do recognize some of my own efforts and the answers that I got from these people that I surveyed. For example, isolation and minimizing exposure to others. When the pandemic was at its worst, I quarantined from my non-nesting partner. Since my partners and I were essential workers anyway and facing a fair amount of risk, we would see each other when the numbers were good in our area. Some of my partner's partners quarantined from us for over a year until we were vaccinated. Figuring out people's bubbles of safety and how to best interact with members of Polycules was something that was frequently brought up. Of course, every household varied a bit in exactly what their own protocols were. Some kept things rather loose and others had very strict guidelines. We took a tack of going with the most concerned or most conservative person's risk tolerance. So we took tests, we spaced out visits according to the information available at the time on infection timelines. For example, no one saw a different partner before they had passed the point at which a person would show symptoms of infection, which meant less frequent visits. We discussed any additions or deletions to folks we would be in proximity to before taking actions. We disclosed any possible exposure and quarantined where appropriate. We ceased fluid transfer activities for most interactions. We followed evolving guidelines to the letter. Now, of course, everyone varied in terms of what their individual efforts were. I will say that as I was going through the survey, there weren't any red flags that I personally noticed. Everybody was loading up on their hand sanitizer, isolating as much as possible, and when they didn't really have a clear answer of what to do, use their best judgment, which I think all of us did. In light of all the measures that were taken, I was really curious to see if the participants of my survey felt they and their extended networks had done well during this pandemic. Overall, most seemed pretty satisfied, though a few did express some doubts. I think I personally did pretty alright. 
but I'm less sure about my partners. My emotional bandwidth was certainly stretched by the pandemic, so there was definitely needless emotional harm caused. But none of us got the disease, so that's nice. The majority of respondents echoed this sentiment, that they did the best under these rather extreme circumstances that they found themselves under. Certainly I consider myself in the did the best I could, I think, shrug camp. I mean, there are some things that maybe I would have done a little bit different in retrospect, like I would have probably had a bit more of a solid plan to see people early on, because that interaction, as little as it was, did really help to get me through this pandemic. Also, I probably wouldn't have drank so much box wine either. I mean high class alcohol that I definitely didn't just buy from a nearby convenience store. Seeing as everyone felt like they did more or less okay, I think this brings us to one of the big questions, the one that has been asked on many a Facebook polyam group. Were polyamorous people more prepared for this pandemic? I think the public understanding of polyamory already includes a lot of hand-wringing over disease and potential STI exposure already. Go ahead and add a pandemic to that and it just got up to a whole new level. I know I personally have occasionally gotten some like really weird judgmental comments in the past year and a half. Like I'll just be talking on Twitter about why polyamory works for me and then just some rando who isn't even following me by the way will just go, <clears throat> um, gentle reminder that there's a pandemic going on. Uh, excuse me for wanting to just wax poetic about my relationship structure for a fucking minute. It's not like the story ended with me saying, and then me and 20 people at the orgy all coughing each other's faces. The end. Anyway, most people who took my survey were in agreement that non-monogamous folks were in fact more prepared for this pandemic than their monogamous counterparts. They often pointed towards the high communication that is more normalized within non-monogamous structures. Definitely more prepared because we are already ideally having conversations about sexual safety and exposure risk, etc. Interestingly enough, some people actually felt it was unfair to compare the two, and a few even made sure to point out that there were some ways they felt non-monogamous people were actually less prepared for this. More prepared in that, in my experience, ethical non-monogamous people are more likely to accept the realities of the pandemic, less likely to be vaccine resistant and mask resistant, and more willing to abide by social distancing mandates, but perhaps less prepared emotionally. Whereas mono or saturated people can just turtle in their existing relationships, many of my polyamorous friends are experiencing a great deal of anxiety not being able to socialize or see partners outside of their household. Initially, I was a little resistant to that angle, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized it did make a kind of sense. In monogamy, it's a lot more normalized to get the majority or even all of your emotional support from a single partner, usually someone that you're living with. In polyamory though, emotional support tends to be a lot more communal. Polyamorous folk can be very social and are certainly used to getting support from a wide range of people, including friends, partners, and metamors. To suddenly be cut off from all of that, yeah, I can see why that would be a disadvantage. By the way, I am not saying that all monogamous people only ever get any emotional support from their partners. I, I'm not saying that. Don't put those words into my mouth. I'm just saying that in monogamous culture, it tends to get normalized a lot more. Being a mostly single person living alone during this pandemic has definitely been challenging. And I definitely think I was maybe a bit more unprepared for it than if I had a person or persons to bunker down with. And I can say anecdotally that I did notice quite a few solo polyam people who were being excluded from polycules, usually because they weren't primary or nesting partners. I will say though that I also noticed that my conversations around navigating safety felt a little more natural with my non-monogamous friends than my monogamous ones. So both ways of approaching relationships had their pros and cons. I mean, there's more than two ways of approaching relationships, obviously. We, we don't believe in binaries on this channel. I wanted to give people the chance to share any specific intersections that they lived at that would actually impact the hardships they experienced during this pandemic. There were a lot of communities that were largely ignored during this, not just the non-monogamous one. Living at multiple intersections definitely impacted individual hardships. I also felt it was important to highlight other aspects of polyam people's lives because, much like monogamous folks, we aren't always just focused on our romantic lives. Health, unsurprisingly, was a frequent talking point, whether in regards to themselves, their partners, or other people in the household. Living as a disabled person with a bad immune system made the pandemic very hard in some respects. 
I had to stay very safe, but that was sometimes hard to do. Being reliant on other people for certain things, being stuck living in a house with people who weren't being as safe as me made everything all the more stressful. A few respondents specifically talked about having children and being parents. Not only is having a child make things a bit more difficult, after all you now have another person that you have to take care of and manage during a very stressful time, but that's also a potential another vector for disease. For parents sharing custody of children, for example, that creates a lot of problems around isolating to a single household. Also, people were still having babies this whole time. My daughter was a newborn with breathing issues. I also just want to take a, a moment to pause here and say, uh, Stephanie, if you're watching, I really hope you and, and everyone's doing okay. That sounds so difficult and I can't imagine how hard that was. My sister actually had a baby during this pandemic, her second actually, uh, and there was definitely a lot more stress around this pregnancy than the first one. Luckily, her partner was able to be with her in the delivery room uh, when her time came. It was a very quick labor, fortunately, and there were no complications. Supposedly the baby looks like me. I honestly can't tell. They, they all kind of look like mush until they get to a certain ripeness, you know? Babies are bananas. Despite some sharing hardships, there were a few that shared some really interesting stories about how the pandemic set them up for ideal circumstances so that they could embrace big changes in their life. A lot of folks during the pandemic realized they weren't cisgender or heterosexual, and as a queer non-binary person who finds gender non-conformity attractive, this was a delightful win. More people were considering people like me as potential partners, and more of them also fit my type. I think the significant overlap of queer and poly communities means that a lot of poly people probably found some benefit in this dynamic shift of pandemic lockdowns, giving people the time to question their gender and sexuality. I noticed quite a few people making really big changes in their life, and that for sure include polyamorous people. Some people did things like move or go back to school or start a whole new job. Respondents shared stories of coming out or leaving abusive relationships. I personally know quite a few people who either transitioned or started to transition during this pandemic. Uh, now, some of them, to be fair, were actually starting to play with gender a bit right before, but the pandemic set them up for an ideal circumstance where they could start really exploring that gender and what worked for them in a way that felt very safe. If anyone watching this used the pandemic as an opportunity for a big change in your life, whether you came out or transitioned or tried a new job, uh, tell me that down in the comments below. I'm really interested to see how many more stories uh, I can collect about this because I've, I've seen quite a few. You are currently watching a product of my own big life upheaval and change. To talk about this channel and why I exist and my own pandemic, we're gonna have to get a bit deeper though. So if you don't mind, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and indulge a little catharsis. But first, I think I'm gonna get a little too comfortable. <sighs> there we are. This has been pretty much my go-to pandemic outfit for the past year and a half. I have washed it, you know, occasionally. Now this is the part of the video where I remind all of you that this video does have a content warning for discussions of mental illness, uh, specifically also mentioning suicide ideation. If that is something you do not wish to engage with, no judgment from me, you can jump to this time code right here and uh, I'll see you all at the conclusion. Really understand my life now and how the pandemic has affected me, we have to go back a couple of years. Back to the ancient year of 2018. Ooh. At the end of 2018, I was having a bad time, putting it very fucking mildly. We don't need to get into all the specifics. There was a lot of personal shit going on at the time that contributed to it. But all of that led to me experiencing the worst depressive episode I've ever had in my life. I mean, you know, so far. For me, um, my mental illness stuff can have some physical symptoms, or at least what feels like physical sensations accompanying them. Um, I'll be honest, I have a lot of concerns about being too specific on um, here, and I really don't want, you know, speculation uh, or, you know, unsolicited advice in the comments below. Please refrain from doing that. All you really need to know is that I have been diagnosed with two personality disorders, and sometimes when I'm going through depressive episodes, it can be physically uncomfortable. Usually when I experience these more physical symptoms, uh, they last kind of briefly, you know, a couple of days, maybe a week at most. 
But during this depressive episode at the end of 2018, they lasted for a month and a half. And those sensations, which initially were uncomfortable, prolonged like that, became agony. So I made a plan to end my life. Suicide ideation is honestly pretty normal for me. I've been dealing with it since middle school, so kind of a pro. And uh, of course, sometimes are worse than others. Making a plan is a lot more rare for me to do. Picking a specific time and date because I was trying to arrange it so um, that my, I would be found and my cats wouldn't suffer. That's never happened before. Uh, spoiler, I didn't go through with it. I came way too close to comfort, but I didn't go through with it. And instead, I made a promise to myself. I told myself that I was going to give it one more year. One more year. And then if I felt the still, say, still felt the same way, then I would, you know. And a few months later, this would have been April in 2019, some really big changes happened. The first was that I found a therapist who I am still seeing to this day. And the second was that I went to my first comedy open mic. I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Just, just stick with me. We're just, we're taking the scenic route. Some of you may have guessed, but performance is a long love of mine. I've been doing it since middle school. I mean, younger, if we count things like elementary school recitals and you know, stuff like that. I even went to college for uh, theater arts, concentrating in acting. Uh, nothing fancy. I'm from poor people. I went to a state university. But still, all of that is to say that I really love getting on a stage and having people react to me. Yes, I'm yet another theater major on YouTube. Please bitch about it in the comments below before you hit unsubscribe. But for a lot of reasons that we don't really need to get into, I just really didn't have the confidence to try and make the life that I actually wanted. When college ended and I graduated, I didn't try to get a job in the theater world at all. I didn't audition for plays. I didn't even try to be a stagehand or anything like that. Instead, I got a very boring day job in an office. And so I had friends who were in the theater world, drag performers, burlesque performers, more traditional theater people as well. But all I would allow myself to do was spectate. I thought that was the best I deserved. So the fact that I actually went to an open mic and tried my first kinda type five was a really big deal. That combined with me finally going to therapy, which is something I had kinda done a couple of times in the past, but never very consistently. And certainly not with somebody like my current therapist who's actually really good at like pushing back on the things I say and challenging me. She is so good, y'all. Like she gives me therapy homework. She calls me out of my bullshit. Like she's fantastic. She also recently stopped accepting my insurance. So if you want to go over to patreon.com slash mainly Mandy, you can help keep me sane. At first I was going rather sporadically, you know, about once a month or so. But as time went on, I started to go more frequently, eventually becoming a once a week habit. At the same time, I was also starting to become more ingrained into the burlesque world as well. I got feedback. I started to gain more confidence. I got better at writing jokes about my boobs, at being a child-free disaster by, and I actually got booked, paid to do comedy. I mean, it was just local and, you know, five bucks the first time, but still, holy shit. I even started to get booked with some local burlesque shows as well. There was actually a mental health themed burlesque show that I was a part of and it was amazing. It was such a great show, such an amazing lineup and a fantastic crowd. That show was a little over a year after my near suicide attempt, February of 2020. A few weeks before COVID made its main debut, I premiered my first actual stripping burlesque number. And then a week before our first cases here in Maine, I actually co-hosted a pirate themed burlesque show. That would be the last time I would be on stage for over a year. Certainly was the last time I was paid to be on one. So for me, when the pandemic hit, 
it hit me really hard, you know, because I had finally tried, you know, I had finally fucking tried. I had actually tried to get over my excuses and actually tried to do this thing that I've been wanting to do for years, you know, but was always just too scared or just didn't think I deserved to even try, right? And I and I was doing it and I was actually working meaningfully on my mental illness and actually getting help and, and working through all my bullshit. And I was having success, actual fucking success, something that some people can try for years and never even get a taste of, even when they're actually really fucking good. And then just boom, nothing, COVID, full stop. All that momentum, fucking gone. In September of 2020, I had another depressive episode. I wanna be very clear that it was not nearly as bad as the end of 2018 by a long shot, uh, but it was still, you know, a struggle as they tend to be. I was averaging a shower maybe every fourth day or so, and I was basically cycling through the same three t-shirts throughout the majority of that month, so real cute look. And when I came through to the other side, I took some time to really sit down and think to myself, what are some things that I can do that can make me feel happier and satisfied? And part of that was definitely me being inspired by seeing some of my friends who were doing things like moving and getting engaged and even my trans friends who were you know, transitioning and becoming so much happier and more confident. Which is when I started thinking, hey, maybe I should start that YouTube channel I've been thinking about. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Starting a YouTube channel during all this has been interesting, to say the least. Um, it, it's been really nice to have this creative outlet that simultaneously seems to actually be putting some good out in the world. I mean, hopefully, anyway. I mean, some of the comments certainly have said so, so that's great to hear. I've made friends and connections that I really hope will stay in my life for a long time, if not the rest of it. And honestly, having some early success is just so wild and surreal to me. You know, the fact that I have 2,000 subscribers, like a little over that, is just unbelievable. You know, as, as unbelievable and wild and surreal as it was when I was first starting to get, you know, paid to do comedy which is also a little scary because there's a part of me that has this anxious concern that at some point I'm going to hit a brick wall again, that something's going to happen and stop all that momentum. But you know, I'm trying not to focus on that, but Hey, I'm doing so well now that I'm actually inspiring Abigail Thorne to eat pieces of cake at the end of her videos now that are also about fat phobia and beauty standards and diet culture and such. So ha, huh, look at that, Abigail. I just want you to know it's 100% okay to admit that you're a fan. Come in, my bosom is ready to receive you. Let's go, girl. Fucking audacity of me. Seriously though, uh, for those of you who are actually watching, thank you so much for being here. The support, having you here, whether you've given me money or not, commented and shared them in videos, uh, especially to my little YouTube family. I really appreciate you all being here. Your support, has honestly helped to save my life. So, in conclusion, this pandemic has sucked ass. Seriously, as much as I wish I could just put a neat little bow at the end of all of this, I really can't. Despite what some people think, this is still an ongoing and developing situation. There is no conclusion, because there hasn't been one yet. Here in Maine, there's been a considerable spike in cases, which isn't very surprising, considering that we see a lot more people not wearing masks and refusing to get vaccinated at the same time that we are dealing with an influx of people from out of state. Maine's a tourist destination, so we get tons of people from out of state here every summer looking at our coastlines, and then a bunch more in the fall looking at the leaves changing. Taking up our sidewalks, feeding seagulls, and asking for directions to DeMillo's? The return to normal is a long way off. By the way, there is some fantastic content out there pushing back against the idea that our normal was ever any good to begin with. I highly recommend watching this video by Neil, the liberal cook. The liberal cook is the name of the chant. They themselves are not liberal, okay? Just 
spreading the word. I did ask those who took my survey if they feel that they have been forever altered by this pandemic and will navigate things differently in the future. And they had some very interesting answers. I find myself more interested in pursuing things that would have been especially irresponsible at the height of the pandemic. I want to go to the movies, get tattoos, and although I'm pretty satisfied with my current relationships, I feel more open to pursuing new connections in the future. Now, some of the polyam people who took my survey did feel that nothing's going to be essentially different for them in the future, but many more do feel like it's going to be changed for them. For some, like the Goblin King, it might be for the better, but for others, it could be for the worse. I'm feeling super guarded, and I'm not sure I'll be able to date for a while. And we never really know how things could show up until they do, and I definitely feel some of that creeping in as I try to reintegrate. I definitely feel that I have been irrevocably changed during this pandemic. For one thing, I feel like I'm probably going to be wearing masks now whenever I travel, whether on a train or plane, that's for sure. I'm definitely going to be having hand sanitizer in my purse at all times. I also feel like how people have handled the pandemic is going to be like a future red flag to me, you know? Like I might just like casually bring it up on dates, like how did you feel about those anti-vax protests? And depending how they answer, I might go to the bathroom and never come back. I've already mentioned uh, a bit about how long distance dating is now maybe a bit more of a possibility for me in the future, which is interesting. Certainly that's something I wasn't expecting going into this pandemic. Uh, I also realized that I really don't like dating apps. I don't. They're just exhausting. I think I'm just going to keep just living my life and just meet people as I live it, you know, see who converges on the path as I go along and just enjoy it while it lasts. This pandemic has been horrible in so many ways. But if there's one thing I did learn is that my time, energy, and effort are very valuable. And I think I'm gonna be a lot more selective about how I use that. And I'm gonna save that now for things that really matter to me in my life. You know, my friends and relationships, YouTube, of course, and the destruction of neoliberalism. We can't just focus on the silver linings though. People are still dying. I know that's bleak. I know you might not wanna hear that, but that's the truth. This isn't a scary story. This is real fucking life and real people are dying of this every day. Not all of the deaths that we've seen can be contributed directly to COVID, but were inevitable in light of the already underfunded and overwhelmed social services that we have in this country. As much as it would be great, we are nowhere near back to normal, regardless of what anyone else wants to say. And even once we get back to that, it is so important that we do not forget the lessons that we learned from this experience. Herd immunity is a laughable dream right now, but we all have just sort of accepted that nothing is going to change, so lol I guess. Let's be as safe as we can be. And for lots of us that's okay, but we will forever be asking if someone is fully vaccinated. And especially where our community overlaps with the disabled community, Events will need to make even more arrangements to be inclusive of the most vulnerable among us. To my fellow non-monogamous out there, I'm sorry that you were largely ignored and not considered during this time. I know that made things extra hard. I especially want to give a shout out to everybody out there with mental illnesses or disabilities and or who were extra isolated during this time. A special thank you to everybody who responded to my survey. This video literally would not exist without your help. I had so many fantastic answers and I honestly wish I could have used them all. An earlier draft of the script was like almost 10 pages longer. <laughs> so uh, I'm very sorry if you did not see your answers used. I just want you to know that your feedback was still highly invaluable. And so thank you so much for doing that survey. I hope everybody who watched this feels a little bit more seen. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, between the costume and the candles, I'm pretty sure this is my most expensive video to date. So special thank you to my patrons over on patreon.com slash mainly Mandy. Uh, if you would like to support me every month, you should definitely go over there. My patrons get access to some things like behind the scene pictures and footage that's not shared literally anywhere else. I'm actually going to be working on a burlesque number, something that will not be available on YouTube or anywhere because of content ID. I have to use the copyright music to make it. So that is a great place to go to if you want to have access to it. That will hopefully be out 
around the time of this video, maybe a little bit after, I'll, I'll do my best uh, to, to spam that once, once, once it is out, of course. Alternatively, if you can't commit to a monthly payment, you can go over to PayPal and Venmo and just do like a one-time payment. Or you could also just like this video, share it with your polycules, maybe write a comment down below, feed that algorithm. I'll be seeing you all in the next video, which should be out, uh, actually, and that should not be too long into November, to be honest with you all. Um, it's gonna be a shorter one, rather simple, and we're gonna be talking about uh, something I talked about once before, but fucked up, so we're gonna talk about it again. And then in December, I have something a little special planned, so definitely make sure that you are subscribed, hit that bell so you're notified, and I will see you in the next video. By the way, this isn't red wine. This this is sparkling red wine um, because I can't drink real red wine because I am a child and I eat bubbles. <laughs>